thank you for coming to my talk. Um, I know how the song goes, like after this verse, it goes, um, and so you're back from a coffee break. I just walked in to find you here with that sad look upon your face. Yeah, probably not the best way to continue that. Um, okay, so this is not the way I'm using my computer, right? But this is perfect. So um, my name is Ju. Uh, I was born in China, but I grew up in Italy and I live in London. So that's where I'm from. Um, I work for a company called Norel Inc., which is the main company behind Elm. Um, and I do a lot of like bird noises as at Arkham with a four. Um, before we start, any Elm beginners in the room? Amazing, perfect. Uh, I, I thought that like you know like beginners were going to be shy, but like this is amazing. I'm super happy. Um, Okay, perfect. Coding time, yeah. This is Spotify, not coding. This is coding time. Um, I'd get rid of that. Perfect. So I've, I'm going just like to write some code today, and hopefully it's going to be fun. Um, I have this empty file. I've set up a little bit of machinery using this uh, node program, which is called MLife, which will automatically refresh the page when I make changes to the source. Um, I don't really have time to type the whole Elm program right now, so I'm going to use some magic, and um, I really like Harry Potter, so I'm just going to do uh, Acho si Simple Elm. Cool. Amazing. So uh, this is an Elm program. I'll save. You'll see. Uh, if you don't see like a lot of like red stuff on the screen, that means the program is okay, and most of the times it means it works. So I'm just going to walk you through a little bit, line by line. So we have a module called main. We expose a function called main, which is a package called browser that is used to build um, web apps. We have a module called HTML, which does HTML, and some HTML attributes. We have a model, which is an empty record. There's nothing in it. And we have a message, which right now, we only have one case of a message, which is a no op, which does nothing. It's a very useful program so far. Um, and we're using the browser package to create the sandbox. And the sandbox has an init function that takes the initial model, in this case, still empty record, a view, an update. And this is why most people say, you know, the Elm model comes with uh, model view update. This is exactly what's happening in these like three successive lines. Um, model, view, update. Okay? And we have this function that's called the view. It takes a model and emits this HTML message. And this is what then uh, the Elm runtime is going to compile to an actual HTML page. But right now, it's this special type. And we don't really have to worry about how to transform the HTML message into an HTML page. The Elm runtime will do that for you. And right now, we say, hello world. And here's this the update function. Right? So in our case, uh, this, if we take a look at, um, um, before I continue, I just want to make sure, is everybody comfortable with like function signatures? Any like Erlang guy that doesn't really like type specs? No? Okay. I know there's, there's like Erlang people, creators, whatever. Um, uh, um, anyways, so this is the type spec. Uh, there, uh, you get a message, a model, and you emit another model. And this is like part of the Elm, you know, way of doing things. I think it's a bit copied from Gen Server, but don't say this out loud. Um, anyways, so we have this update and no op model. So this program does literally nothing apart from printing to screen uh, something, which is oh, this is a big spoiler. Just don't look for a second. Perfect. Hello world. Um, so if I just split a little bit the code here and there, I can say, um, if I change this to be um, high Krakow, right? And I save, you hold the machinery will go into place, a lot of like, little gremlins inside my computer will make sure that this happens. And um, just to, like, for fun, you know, like now I have a message here and my model is empty and I don't know, I feel, like it feels bad, right? So I'd rather have something like a message inside my model, it's a string. And when I init it, instead of just passing an empty thing, I'll just say, hi, Krako. Cool. And um, instead of calling hi, Krako here, 
I'm just going to grab the model. So model dot um, message. Nothing changed, but everything works. So I think it's like this pretty easy way of like thinking about like where you're throwing your data and how you visualize it. So um, that was for you know complete um, beginners. So what I want to do really um, is I play guitar sometimes, and there are these websites where you can see this sort of representation of how a song works, and there's lyrics and chords. Unfortunately, the representation is like all textual, so there's no metadata. So you have to do some pretty good like software engineering to get out all the things. And unfortunately, even in 2019, there are websites out there that show you this text and fill the page with ads, full page models, autoplaying videos, all the way through. So it's like you think it's impossible, but just go to ultimateguitar.com um, and you'll see what I mean. Um, so I thought, well, there's nothing in this problem which can't be solved just with code. So um, what I want to do in this talk is to show you how we could solve this problem using regular expressions, how you shouldn't do that, and how instead we can use a more powerful tool, which is a parser. And like in this case, we're going to use Elm parser, but you can you know, reuse this uh, knowledge for any sort of parser that you can find. Uh, I hope that by the end of the talk, you'll get out here like, oh no, I'm never going to use regular expression ever again in my life. Then proceed to use them, but still know that you're a bit dirty now. Like, you know, it's like not the best thing out there. Um, cool. So I'm going to make this full screen so it's like slightly more readable. So um, let's get started. I'm going to grab a sheet, a sheet. Perfect. Um, and it'd be nice if we could at least like show like this thing a little bit like in our page, right? I'm going to use like, this little thing, which is the let expression, which allows you to create these sort of like temporary variables. And I'm going to create a thing called lines. And these lines is going to be string lines sheet. Okay? And here uh, I want to do something with this. So I'm going to get rid of that. I'm just going to do a map. And this map is going to go over the lines. And for each line, I want to create a div. For each div, I want to create a span. And inside the span, I'll probably want to write the line. And inside, uh, I'll just give it a class. So I'm going to, just going to do something like this. OK, I save, it compiles. Uh, you'll see, like, this is like a common thing. Like, when I save, I don't see like, the random red stuff on the left-hand side of the screen. I'm 100% sure like, the thing is going to show uh, well if I open the right page. Um, but you can see like the program just like did everything of that and it worked more or less. Um, okay, cool. So now we're going to write a wonderful regular expression together. Who wants me to write this live? <laughs> Amazing. Love you guys, folks, whatever. Um, so yeah, uh, packages elmlang.org. I want to do a regex. There's a really nice package called Elm Regex. So I look at the documentation. There's a from string that returns a maybe regex. So a maybe is a type which can either be just and a value or nothing. And you usually use it to handle cases where you're not really sure what happens. Let's say you have uh, a list. You want to get the first element in the list. Uh, most of the times that works. But when the list is empty, what's the value really? It's like uh, an existential question. But um, that's how you use a maybe. So in this case, we want to use a maybe when you're using from string, because sometimes you pass a regex which is not right. So Elm will try to compile this string into a regex, but if it fails, it'll just say, well, you know, you're on your own. Um, so I'm not trying to escape my duties to write a regular expression. Uh, actually, let me just uh, install it. Um, Control Z, Elm install. Elm regex. And you'll see, I just like love this error message. It's like, would you like me to update your Elm JSON accordingly? It feels like, you know, like I have employed the butler. And you're just like, yes, cool, awesome. Back to it. Um, I just import uh, the regex, import regex. 
And then I'm going to write a regex. And the regex is just uh, regex, regex. And this means uh, the module is regex and the type is regex. OK, no big deal. Um, we are going to use this function regex from string. And now we have to think, what do we want to do? We want to create a string that is able to understand either what a chord is or what lyrics are. So I think chord is like quite easy because we see there's these square brackets. So unfortunately, in the regular expression community, square brackets, um, they're a meta character. They, mean, they don't mean what they look like they mean. So you have to ex escape them. But since I'm writing this inside an Elm string, I have to escape the escape as well, which is pretty nifty, I think. Maybe. Uh, and so this is the initial one, and then this is the closing one. As I said, in the regular expression syntax, uh, the square brackets have a special meaning, which is a character set, which means everything which is inside it just treat it as a sort of its own like group. So I'm just going to do that. Um, in the um, Western world, um, I forgot the D there, um, musical notation, these are the seven notes. I know there's like flats. Don't bother me with the accidentals, please. Um, this, like, this is a joke for the music nerds. But... And then we can have a lowercase m, which means like the chord is minor or the chord is major. And I add the question mark to signify the previous character could be there or could not be there. Perfect. I have everything I need. This is for all the chords. Or I can have the lyrics. And just as a simple way to do that, I'll just, I'm just going to, say, to create a new character set saying everything but the open square bracket. OK? And then I'm going to say I want a sequence of like this character set, which is one or infinite. So this is with a plus. And we're done with our regular expression. We know this thing returns a maybe, so I'm going to use a pipe operator, which might be familiar to um, Elixir or F sharp users. And since this thing returns a maybe, I want to return still a, like a valid regex. So I'm going to pass this default value within the Elm regex uh, library, which is never. Which basically means try to compile this string into a regex. And if you fail, I won't match anything. You're just, you know, you're done. Um, cool. So now we have everything. I'm just going to quickly um, display something. So uh, I'm going to replace here. I'm going to say regex. Um, dot find. I'm going to pass regex. We have the line of text. Yeah. And for each one of these, I'm just going to do a view regex. I won't bore you with the details on how to write HTML. I think it's pretty um, simple. But I should prefix my thing with acho. Acho view regex. Perfect. And as you can see, the, uh, that regex find returns a list of matches. And for each of the match, I, like, that's a record with like, a lot of different fields, like the index and a lot of like, extra meta uh, information. But I'm just going to grab the match for now. And for each one of the matches, I'm just going to wrap it with a span that has a class token. Okay? I save. It compiles. Um, wrong tab. But there you go. You can see there's like, a little bit of border. And means that our regular expression, it worked great. Um, and that's the end of the talk. No, of course not. Um, so I think that's the thing. Is like, first of all, right now, our regular expression doesn't really distinguish chords and lyrics. Because we just put this uh, really nice uh, or expression in the middle of the regex, this character. And in reality, it doesn't really recognize what is a chord and what are lyrics. It just managed to recognize what is text, which has this like weird shape. And I know that the regex like, enthusiasts out there will say, oh, but there's like ways to give names to uh, partial capture groups and things like that. That is true. Um, but even if you had that, um, what does the regular expression know about this chord? Does he know it's an A chord? Does he know it's a minor chord? No. He just knows, oh, mate, like, I found like, these four characters. I'm pretty sure there's a chord in it. Like, you do that. You, know, like, you, you then have to strip the square brackets, have to like, look at the first character, look if it's an A, a B, a C, look if there's a minor. Of course, like, this is a simplified example. But like, you'll see like, in the final result, there's so many different types of chords out there. Like, you'll just, you know, like, if you look at the existing JavaScript implementations, they throw this huge regex at the chord, and then they have these 200 lines of 
very finely crafted code that tries to move around the string and make, like, and they have like their own assumptions. They try to move back and move forward. It's a, like, I, I mean, you have to be like a real good programmer, but you know, I'd rather use a tool. Um, awesome. So this is why if you look at the Elm documentation, like on, on regex, it says, generally speaking, it will be easier and nicer to use a parsing library like Elm parser instead of this. And even, I mean, you don't have to feel bad, right? Like, like that's the thing, the same I, thing I did. It's like, I look at this, this message, like, ah, whatever, you know nothing, I'll show you. Um, but then I was like, yeah, no, he's right. Um, awesome. So we're going to do that using Elm parser. Elm install Elm parser. Yes, please. FG. And we're going to import this parser package. Um, there is a way now to import a module in a qualified manner. So instead of typing parser everywhere, I just want to type capital P because it's nicer. And I'm just going to expose all the functions in the current namespace. You shouldn't do this, but I think it makes for like nicer presentation code, not for nicer production code. Um, our beautiful regex. Actually, you know what? I'm just going <laughs> to. There you are. Um, and instead of uh, tackling the hard problem, I'll just try tackling a simpler problem, problem first. So instead of saying just parse a thing, I'm just going to pass uh, a list of chords. So A minor, I'm going to pass C, I'm going to pass F, I'm going to pass G. Um, if you're a music enthusiast, you know like these four chords are really cool because you can build something along 200 pop songs with just like the same chord progression. There's an amazing video by this band which is called The Axis of Awesome. And it's, they made the song which is called The Four Chord Song. And it's like four minutes where you have all the, you know, like the most common song, pop songs uh, in Western culture of the last 15 years, all made using these four chords. So that's pretty cool. Um, okay, so let's start with our problem. Uh, we want to write the parser that is able to parse a chord, right? So I don't have anything of that yet. So I'm just going to write random stuff and hope that the computer will help me. I'm going to say I want a chord parser. And the parser library exposes uh, this tag type, which is a parser. But you have to tell it like of what, right? And I'm going to say it's a parser. And this is a big problem, right? Like since like at this point, we've, uh, we've been thinking the problem using regular expressions and regular expressions operate on a big text text and they emit text and we haven't really thought at our domain problem like we want to represent this chord so what is a chord like and we've never answered this question so let's try to you know ask ourselves a question and answer it at the same time uh, i'm going to say that a chord i really would like i wish that the chord would be something like um, a chord it's a bit weird here because you can see there's a Type chord, like there's a chord on the left hand side of the equals, and there's a chord on the right hand side of the right hand side of the equals. Um, the difference is that the one on the left hand side, so type chord, that's a type. But the one on the right hand side, that's a data constructor, which we will also use it uh, later as a function. So it's a bit weird, but just bear with me. It will look better like in a few minutes. Um, and I'm going to say that the chord has a note and also has a quality, right? I want to distinguish if it's a minor chord or a major chord. Um, so I'm just going to say what's a quality, it's going to be major or minor, okay? And then I'm going to see what's a note, and I'm going to do something really similar to what I did before, I just say uh, it's these um, things. Um, pardon me for the lack of accidentals. Um, cool, this compiles. Um, this thing doesn't compile yet, but we're going to make it compile with a very simple way. We're just going to call a function which is called succeed. And succeed uh, basically will return what we pass to it, to the result of the parsing. So we always have to remember that a parsing is an operation where you have an input string and you want to get some more refined types, like after the thing has succeeded, right? So I want to say succeed, I'm going to return a chord which is chord A minor, okay? As any musician knows, like A minor is the best chord out there. Like you'll never, like you can invent your own chord, but it'll never be as cool as A minor. So we're going to build this very simple chord parser that always returns A minor. 
Yeah, it's good stuff. Um, and instead of doing this regex, I'm just going to do, um, so uh, I, I want to run this um, parser, right? So I just do p run, I test the parser, and then I test the line, right? Uh, but we can feel that something can go very wrong when trying to parse, because if someone tries to send us a chord, maybe that should be okay, but if someone starts typing, uh, you know, like his like washing machine instructions, it probably shouldn't return anything proper. So there's this data type which represents that, which is called a result, which in Haskell is called either, and basically it represents, it's sort of like maybe, so it represents this computation which could go okay or go really wrong. And the difference between a uh, maybe and a result is that when something goes wrong in a maybe, you get nothing. And literally, like, you get this, this thing, which is nothing. But if you get an error when you're doing something with the result, it will say error, and then it will attach some error messages, right? And that's how, like, for example, when you make a mistake when you're writing your source code, your compiler usually tells you some more or less helpful information about what went wrong, right? And it does like something like that. Um, so we're just going to do a case and pattern match on that. I'm going to say when it's okay, it's going to be a chord. And if it's a chord, I'm pretty happy. I'll just make a span. I'm going to call like a quick debug string to print this chord. Or I'm going to have an error and the error is going to be a span. It's going to be um, debug of the error string. Cool. This thing compiled. So let's go and see the result. All A minors. Wonderful. Um, okay, so let's try to make this parser a little bit more useful. Instead of always returning A minor, we'll actually make it work. Um, so as I said before, this chord A minor, you can read it as a function. So the function is chord, and it takes two values. The first one is A, and the second value is minor, right? Um, so what I'm going to do here is to write two small sub-parsers. One is going to take care of the notes, and one is going to take care of the quality of the chord. Right? Uh, so I'm just going to replace this for now with this like underscore. We're going to fill it up later. And here I'm going to use one of these special operators that uh, the Elm parser, like the Elm parser library adds. Uh, I'm going to do a node parser and I'm going to do a pipe equal quality parser. Um, from now on, I'm going to refer at this pipe equals operator as the human funnel operator. So you just think someone grabs something, it's just like throwing it away somewhere. And the reason why this I call the human funnel is because you get this note, and then I actually want to pass it up. I want to apply it to the succeed, right? So in reality, the shape of this function that gets to the succeed should be something like uh, with two arguments. So it should be something like a note, and then we have a quality, and then I can wrap it with my chord function, right? Not quality. But in reality, uh, that's exactly uh, what Elm does under the hood when you define a type like this. It will automatically define a function called chord, which you can use. So all this is uh, exactly equivalent as writing chord. So I'm just going to save that extra anonymous function, but I hope this is um, easy to follow. And I'm going to use a let expression like before, and I'm going to describe a node parser. Uh, if you've uh, watched the talk before this, uh, there is a way when you're creating property-based tests to use one-off, to choose one-off multiple alternatives. And you do the same when you're writing a parser, because when you're trying to figure out what is the note, you want to try with A, you want to try with B, you want to try with C, and so on and so forth, right? So I'm just going to do that, say one-off, and then I'm going to say, um, this thing should return, um, succeed an A. So like this note value that we just defined like a few lines above, when we do something. And this something is described with this code. And this is what I call the, um, I imagine this British lord from the 18th century, and they have this uh, watch pocket Right? where they just have put like their stuff. So these operators, are, I'll refer like, from now on as the um, watch pocket operator. And basically, you just think something that matches and just puts it in, like, in his like, own like, little watch pocket, like instead of sending it up. So that's why you see that it just succeeds with A. A is not a function because it doesn't take anything. It's just a value. And this operator says, yeah, I'm going to match this symbol, but I'm just going to keep it for myself. You don't have to bother uh, with it. Right? And I'm going to do the same for the notes um, in our um, little thing. I'm just going to say note uh, G. I'm going to say note um, C. Okay? Um, oh, no. 
Uh, I should have done it like this. Perfect. Cool. I'm not going to do the other notes because it's boring, but you can do it as an exercise. Um, OK, quality parser. So I want to understand if this thing is a minor or um, a major chord. So I'm going to do the same. P1 off is going to be P succeed minor when I uh, watch pocket the symbol lowercase m. And instead, there is also a case where I want a major chord. And a major chord, um, like this E, is just something which has the E and then nothing, right? So uh, the, the way that we represent this like in the parser um, library is just say, well, if you can't match anything, just succeed with major. And that's all, OK? I type it, no errors. Let's take a look at Safari. I'm going to get some drinks. Mm. I think what's pretty cool about this is that um, using this uh, code, we've described what, uh, what we think a chord is. Um, but also now our code knows that as well. We haven't just specified how a string looks like. Now our code knows that that thing is a chord A minor. And it can do a lot of stuff with it now that it knows what it is, right? It's not just a string anymore. It's like real proper stuff. And this is, you know, like if you think how your computer operates, like how you normal program in a language, it does this. Like it tries to convert this text that you throw out into a file into some internal representation. And this is like a very simple way just like to try this sort of concept out. Um, but I cheated, right? Like the regular expression was doing more than this. It was like actually operating on real strings. So, I mean, who am I to, you know, get down from fight? Let's just do that. Um, so if I save now, you'll see like the, er the there will be a bunch of errors, but they're not as bad as you can think, right? Like you can see, see that the first error is uh, you're saying I'm expecting symbol A or I'm expecting symbol F and expecting symbol G and expecting symbol C, and this is because we are still passing the core parser to the full line. So the full line is like, we're trying to parse each line as a single chord, and it's like saying, oh, I'm expect like you just define that the your thing should start with one of these four characters, and there's none of that. So I think there's something wrong. So let's fix that. We're going to write a line parser. And this line parser is going to uh, be a parser of a line. Well, what is a line? Um, I think that's like what I really love like, about programming in Elms. Like you have these like grand ideas on how your code is supposed to work, and then you come to terms with the sad reality that I haven't done that work yet. And, but it's nice, like it's like this wishful programming. Like you think of something that you really like to have, and then you just make it. Uh, so I'm going to say that the line is um, actually a list of tokens. So I'm going to say that uh, a line, type alias, is a list of token. Uh, token, that's a different thing. Um, and what is a token? I'm glad you asked. Type token. Uh, it can either be something that we recognize as a chord. So I'm just going to give it a name which is parsed. And I'm going to tag it with the actual chord. Or I'm going to say that this is just you know lyrics. And this is a string, right? And, and maybe for now, I'm going to get rid of this like intermediate representation, because I think it's just like simple enough. There's no need to have an extra level of abstraction. Uh, line parser. And I'm going to use the same trick as above. So I'm going to say this can be one off. It can be a succeed of parsed. When I um, watch pocket uh, the symbol um, this, and then I have to say now the chord, right? And if you've written enough regular expressions, I'm sure like you've bumped into this case. Like you, you just want to re reuse a little bit of another regular expression you've used just before, and you're like, oh, I can't do that. I have to do some like weird string stuff. But if you have a parser like data structure, you can do that has as much as you want. So like now I'm just going to chord parser. And then I'm going to say this, like the chord though, funnel it, right? Because I want it to uh, be passed like to the chord. I want to have that value eventually. Um, OK, so and then I'm just going to tie like the loose ends. I'm going to say that I want also the closing thing. And if you manage to match all this, then this is success, a successful chord parsing. And now I'm going to have to handle the case when I'm doing uh, lyrics, right? So uh, there's, doing lyrics is a bit weirder, right? Because uh, so far we've been uh, 
like looking at the character, matching it, and then moving to the next. But when we are matching lyrics, we actually want to look a bit in the future. We want to pick ahead a little bit. So in order to do that, we have to use a function which is called chomp while, which will basically keep um, taking the input and throwing away, but also looking at the next character. And that's why the function that we need to pass is this um, character. And the character has to be different from the thing. So in a sort of way, like we're writing the same thing that we're thinking of the regular expression, right? Just like with like, more code. Um, and this is a case like in regular expressions where the chomp while can also match if you can't match any text at all. It's like a zero or more match. So in reality, in this case, for, uh, a ly like for some lyrics, I want to match at least one character. So I'm going to use this chomp if function, which has another condition. In my case, I don't really care at all about it. So I'm just going to say true. And then I need to grab all these things that were chomped and actually be able to use them, right? So there is a function which is called get chomp string. And I just need to wrap this quickly with another uh, small parser. Um, I'm just going to do this and watch pocket the rest. And this will more or less like do the right thing. Um, cool. Save this. Elm format successfully formats the text. You, like you see, like I've entered garbage, but now it looks like real code. Um, but there's an error. OK, what's the error? Something is off with the body of the line parser definition. Um, the one-off call produces parser token, but the type annotation line parser says it should be parser list token. Of course. Thank you, computer. So as I said, I want to keep looping you know, like over my line and grabbing either core, some lyrics, core, lyrics, core, core, lyrics, lyrics, and things like that. But I made a mistake. I'm, um, I'm only human. So I'm going to do a succeed. In this case, I want to return a list eventually. So I don't really want to wrap it with any function. So I'm going to use this special function's identity, which basically means don't wrap it. Just return me whatever you were able to human funnel. And here, as a human funnel, I'm going to use a function called loop, which loops. And it takes two arguments. One is the initial value of the accumulator, which is empty list. And then it takes also um, a helper function. I'm not going to take like to type out the full type signature of line parser helper because that's like a bit weird. So I don't want to trouble you with that. Uh, just know that it takes this accumulator as this argument, and instead of returning like our tokens, it will actually return special parser values, which are pretty easy to understand. One is loop, signify keep looping. Done to signify you're done. So yeah. Um, so I'm going to do that. As I said, this can just be like anonymous function. I'm going to say return loop. Take the current value, like the, the current core that you were able to parse, tag it with parsed, and put it in front of the accumulator. So this is uh, the cons operator. It just means to prepend to a list. Um, I don't know why I had the Scottish accent for a second, but um, it just does that. Uh, and I do the same with lyrics. So if you are able to grab some lyrics, I'm going to say, well, just keep trying and just, uh, you know, tell me, like, just like save whatever. It's, this is like very similar, like to like a reduce operation, right? Like a, a fold operation. And if, you, if the parser can't do any of that, we can just say, well, uh, you're done, right? So I'm just going to say uh, done. And as you, if you notice, I've been prepending like, things to the list. So now actually in the accumulator I have all the things reversed. So as the last step of the recursion, I'm just going to do list reverse accumulator. And um, did I make a mistake somewhere? Succeed, let's see the error. Uh, succeed function, uh -huh -huh, very good. So the succeed function expects one argument but got three instead. And this is because I didn't use the human funnel operator here. Cool, awesome. Um, and here, like this is like the 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 all like that's necessary. So the only thing that we need is to display this. So instead of running the core parser, I'm going to run this uh, line parser that we just written. And instead of using this logic, I'm, I've just written like a small uh, view result function in the view to make it a bit nicer to look at. Um, and here I'm going to use my charms knowledge to actual view 
result. Um, as you can see, it's like not magic. It just does the same thing we did before. It does this case on this result. It's either OK and a list of tokens or error, and we're going to debug string the error. And in case it's a token, I'm just going to say if it's a parsed chord, pattern match the chord and print it like with this like little span. Or if it's a string, just put the empty span like with no other things. Um, if you look at the browser, ta -da. Um, so. If you look at this, like the result is not that much different from the result of the regular expression, right? Like you'd like wonder, well, why did I go through all this trouble? And the output is pretty much the same. Uh, what I want to argue for is like it's completely different because now your code like knows exactly what the chord is, and if you know what the chord is, it means that you know what the A minor chord is. You know what are the notes that compose an A minor. You can represent a guitar fretboard just in pure Elm. You can write an algorithm to select these chords and choose the ones which are nice for guitarists to play. And you couldn't do that like without the parser. So I just want to show like very simply like what you could have. And this is like a very similar code. I can show it if we have enough time later. But basically, I've just made it like a little bit nicer to look at. And when you hover on a chord, it does what I said. So it understood this is an A minor. It understands the notes that compose the A minor. It will represent the guitar fretboard in Elm, look at all the notes, find the right combinations that the guitarist really likes to play, because guitarists are very finicky about that. Um, and as a, like, as a proof that it works, for example, we have this C chord, right? And the C chord, I can tell you, and you have to trust me on this, that this thing, this lower black thing, that's a C note. That's where the C note is on the guitar. And if you wanted a B note, you have to go up. It would be here. And there's a notation in guitar, uh, like notation that you can override the root of a chord. So if you have a C slash B, means play the C chord, but instead of the root C, play a root B. So it's like it's pretty fun. And this is exactly what the library does, and it automatically like does that, right? As as soon as you understand what the string is, and you can have it in code. There's no limits to what you can do. Um, and I just want to show quickly how that looks like. So, um, oh, I have to, sorry, I have to import, install the library. So I've published this. Uh, I can, um, chords. Yeah, do it. FG, perfect, no more errors. Um, and you can see, um, Pretty much the same. I have the same sheet, and I just have this little thing which is called hover chord, which is what I use in now to represent where the user is hovering, right? And then I have a new message which is hover chord, and I just whenever the user is doing that, I'm just calling this action, and then in the model I will handle it. Um, and here it's exactly the same as we've seen before. I'm doing a split. I'm calling the parser of like the proper library, which is like a bit more convoluted than the one we just seen today. And I'm, but you see, like it's basically the same thing. I'm casing on a result. Like it's exactly the same code. And if you're curious in how, oh no, that's a um, different folder. But I can go in Elm chords, and if I open chords Elm and I look at the parse chord, you can see this is the actual parser they have written, which supports a lot of different types of chords. And all this is backed up by um, the notate, like the, the actual type. And these are um, all the types that like this library recognizes right now. I had to do a lot of studying on Wikipedia, but yeah, it was worth it, I hope. Um, so um, let me just go back to the slides. I just want to say, um, now I've added this, so I think it's going to be quite easy to add ukulele and, ba and bass support, because it's just the same logic, more or less. You just need to change how many strings are there and the default tuning of um, the instruments. I want to improve parser error messages, because right now uh, it just throws you the whole stack. But I would really like to send you like nicer error messages, like you try to type AM6B7, but actually that's not the right notation. Possible alternatives are this, just like to help you when you're writing the, the course sheet. Property-based tests, like it's something I haven't done. I've just you know thrown 40 unit tests at it and hoped um, that it worked. And then out of this, I actually want to buy something that is able to eradicate like that source of evil, which is ultimateguitar.com. Um, 
Okay, so my name is Chu. You can find me in, online as, uh, at Arcam. Uh, this is the GitHub repo with the uh, Elm code. If you're curious about my Vim files, so don't ask questions about that, please. They're here. Um, if you want to work uh, with Elm remotely from Europe, um, just come and join us. And yeah, that's all I had. Okay, let's find the speaker. Are there any questions? It was really interesting talk. Can you pass the mic? Uh, so, about your Vim files. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, I, I have actually, to add something. We're not adding type classes to Elm yet, and I'm not talking about my Vim files. What? <laughs> Okay, no, seriously, uh, is there, like, in this Elm parser library, mm -hmm. is there uh, some kind of many function or many one? This is what I'm used to from the parser combinators. Or do you always have to go with this loop? Uh, there are, like, slightly more advanced um, operators. So if you look at the, I should have done this, actually. Uh, thank you for reminding me. There is a parser advanced um, fun like module, which sort of operates like the parser module, but it allows you to pass more types. So for example, you can create types which really describe uh, in a closed way your domain errors and things like that. There's no like parser combinator support like inside this library. I think there was one in that worked with Elm 18. I'm not sure, I'm not like aware of anyone for Elm 19, sorry. Um, but I've seen activity like on, I've been stalking their like um, GitHub repositories. So I've seen someone has pushed this branch that updates one of the dependencies to L19. So I think it just like needs somewhere, someone to go out there and do it. Um, but I'm lazy. Uh, okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, thanks, I like the idea, I like the approach. Uh, however, I wonder, so the type system is already quite powerful and uh, I would expect the only extra step to have after I describe my types is to describe the set of literals that should represent the leaf, so to say. And then I would just expect to uh, run some magic like flex or something like this and mm -hmm. get the parser without uh, the need of explicitly describe like loop while and stuff like this. Mm -hmm. Did you look into such solutions? Um, I think that's like a design decision of the parser uh, because, for example, the parser by default does not backtrack. So for example, something that I haven't said during the presentation is that you have a string like uh, Dobby to keep the Harry Potter theme. Um, the first capital D will match against the D major chord, right? Uh, but then if you have more characters and it goes down that path of the code, by default, the parser will not try to backtrack, will just fail, right? And I think this, like the reason why this has been done, there's a really nice uh, gist uh, about uh, backtrackable. Like if you look uh, in the documentation, there is a link to backtrackable, and basically the explanation is like this pushes parser writers to be to write more efficient parsers because you think is exactly about like the edge cases uh, of your parser and how you can write it in a way that's as fast as possible. Uh, of course, then you can write backtrackable and sprinkle it around your code. I have done it as well because in some cases I just felt it hurted the readability of the parser. Uh, but I think that's the reason why uh, like it doesn't follow like, the usual path. You just like throw a grammar at it and it just like emits uh, everything. Um, and I don't know, also like, I think like in a way for me it's like, um, it's like very illuminating to try to come up with uh, good errors to show. And I think a grammar is not very good at uh, showing errors. One example of this, you can see it in the parser library. Um, and it, like, it's this example, right? You make, you're trying to write uh, a list of elements. Uh, maybe I can make it bigger. So most parsers will tell you, oh, I, I figured out there's an error in row four, character 17. And you're like, uh, okay, what does it mean? And instead, using this uh, framework, like you can use this function which is called problem, and you can just pass it when you're creating this parser to basically try to guess what was the user trying to do at that point? And what would be the best error message they can write uh, to do that, right? And I think like if you're just thinking of this problem right in the parser, just converting a grammar into another format, you're not thinking about how people can get this wrong and what to do when they get it wrong, right? And ultimately that like impacts like the whole design of your library and 
of a programming language, right? Like the reason why Elm has like such nice error messages is because someone spent a lot of time trying to figure out how you can get this language wrong and what is the best way to let them know what they did wrong, like in the right point, right? So I think that's like also like another reason is like if you allow people to have more steps like to improve these errors, they will, right? Um, yeah, I hope that that was uh, Thanks. a good answer. Yeah. What did you use to uh, display the charts uh, in your sheet? Is there any? Oh yeah, uh, I've just written the SVG render. Um, so there's in the source there's a chord um, chart, and it takes uh, what I call um, a voicing. So a voicing is just a, a representation of how the guitarist is like pressing the strings, and that if you just look at the uh, function signature, you can see that it does view. It takes a label, so like the name of the chord, but sometimes you maybe you want to pass something else. It doesn't have to be um, like the name itself. Uh, there's a voicing and it emits an SVG MSG. So it's like the similar analogy of the HTML message. I'm trying to create an SVG and I just do that. And, and so like all this is absolutely all done just like in pure Elm. There's like no JavaScript, like no, nothing magic. Um, I tried to cheat and find some JavaScript libraries that did this for me, but they all felt a bit weird because I found like a bunch of different packages in JavaScript that were doing a single slice of the problem. And I was like, well, I don't need that. Like, I mean, like if I just have to build like that, I can just build the whole thing. It's not much more complicated. Um, if you're a guitar player, I think it's like, it took me a while to properly render these uh, diagrams. Because some chords, they're not played at the beginning of the instrument, but they're playing further down. So there's a pretty like gnarly logic to get this thing working right, but it does. So, yeah. So you had to pass uh, the places you put your fingers on. No, the... no, no, no. Like so, like the algorithm generates all that. So it takes a chord, oh. and then there's a thing. Um, recognized by, music, by musicians, which is called integer notation, which is just a list of ints. And uh, each different type of chord has a different integer notation. And I'm doing some crazy stuff, but ultimately just converting a chord to something like this. Then I have a representation of what a guitar is. So a guitar has a default tuning. It has like these strings. It, uh, like, it's able to do all that, right? And all this is only possible because like from the parser, we converted this blurb of text into stuff that we can act upon, like in a confident way, right? Who, like, you know, like, I think every time, like, you write in a regular expression, you're just basically saying, I hope this works. I have no idea, really. I hope this works, like, more or less, this should work, and hopefully no one will ever have to touch it again. And instead, when you're writing a parser, you're saying, I'm really confident that this thing is going to work. And when it's not working, it's going to probably emit some interesting error message. I will need to read the code then. Oh yeah, Thank please you. do. It's um, um, it's there. I'm not very proud of it, but it works. I've added some tests, so I'm not completely ashamed of it. Okay. Are there more questions? Because we cannot just live on music. We have to eat also. So there is a food <laughs> out there. Okay. So thank the speakers once again.